Uh, we're going to get started. Thanks so much uh, for the introduction. John, thanks so much for having me here. Uh, it's my first visit to the Broad, and it's been a super cool uh, time already. I just I spent all day yesterday meeting people, learning about all the amazing things happening here, both on the data side and the analytics side and the statistics side, and it's been really fun. Um, and I'm excited to be here to talk to you about uh, a bunch of the different things that, that my group does. Um, so my group is the Freeman Lab, um, and we work at this place here called uh, Genelia, or Genelia Research Campus. It used to be called Genelia Farm. We dropped the farm recently because people were really confused whether it was actually a farm. Uh, although it is sort of in farmland, uh, we do not grow any vegetables. Uh, maybe some people do. Uh, we do grow transgenic animals, but that's a different, uh, different kind of farm. Um, it was recently pointed out to me that Genelia looks a lot like the Starfleet Academy, um, which I thought was sort of actually surprisingly striking, uh, the similarity between these two things. Um, so I run a, a group at Genelia, and my group works on a lot of different things. Um, and the number of different things we work on seems to grow uh, every couple months. And I do believe that all the things we do live in some high dimensional space in which they're all connected. Um, but it doesn't always feel that way. And what I wanted to do today is basically uh, sort of take you on a tour of the kinds of things we do in my group, um, which ends up spanning a pretty broad spectrum, um, both sort of data collection and data analysis and experiments, but then often going on into uh, pretty crazy out there uh, domains, but it is all, I, I believe, uh, connected. And I hope to, yeah, sort of tell you the story of the kinds of things we do um, and how, uh, sort of how they're connected in, in the range that they span and why we end up working on so many different things. Um, so the starting point for, for pretty much everything we do in the lab, uh, because we are at our core uh, neuroscientists who are interested in how the brain works, uh, we, we do experiments where we, we collect data. And a lot of that is done in collaboration at Genelia. Genelia is an incredibly collaborative place. I work very closely with a lot of groups doing uh, various kinds of recordings and measurements, uh, typically of, of brain activity using imaging methods, um, though a variety of other techniques as well, in a variety of systems, including both uh, Drosophila and zebrafish. And a lot of our focus right now um, is in the mouse. So I'm going to show a couple examples of the kinds of recordings we do in the mouse. And the reason the mouse is a very appealing system right now, um, as probably many people here are familiar with, is that it is a system in which we can record the activity of large fractions of the brain simultaneously while animals perform complex behaviors that let us ask questions about, I think, ultimately the kinds of things I would like to understand about how brains work. Um, how do we uh, sort of understand the environment we're in? How do we remember things about the environment? How do we learn? How do we adapt to changes? Uh, these are really deep, fundamental questions. These are things that organisms, including mice, but definitely humans, excel at, and they're things we don't really understand how biological systems are capable of achieving. So the kind of example of, a, of, a, of of work we do, and this is all in collaboration with Carl Sabota's group at Genelia, um, and this is the work of an incredible uh, a former grad student of Carl and now postdoc with Carl and myself, uh, Nick Sofronyev. This is a system Nick built uh, for doing tactile virtual reality in mice. Um, so mice, it turns out, experience the world uh, much more viscerally through their whiskers than through their visual system. Um, so if you're familiar with visual VR, like Oculus, uh, this is sort of like that, but in the tactile domain. And the way this works is the mouse is on this ball running, and she's moving, and there are physical walls on either side of her, and the walls move back and forth, they're on little motors, and the movement of the walls is in closed loop to her running on the ball. So as she runs a little bit towards the wall, the wall will come towards her to make her think that she's winding through a running corridor. So everything is in closed loop, that's super important to create a sort of compelling virtual experience for the animal. Um, and they do this really well. You basically don't need to train them, you just sort of drop them into this environment and they start tracking the wall because this is a very kind of ethologically relevant sensory uh, modality for the animal. It's something they do um, sort of in more or less in the natural world. Uh, think about mice scurrying around in burrows. Uh, this is like that, just a little bit weirder. Um, and while we're doing these, uh, these, these behavioral paradigms, um, the, the most important thing about the fact that the animal is stationary, um, so although she feels like she's running through this corridor, she's not actually moving, her head is fixed, that allows us to use uh, various microscopy methods, in particular two-photon microscopy, to monitor the activity of large populations of neurons, which would not be possible if the animal was actually physically moving around a space. It's only possible because she's technically stationary. Um, so this is just a picture of, of Nick at the rig um, doing these kinds of recordings with this incredibly complex uh, set of MATLAB GUIs, uh, which unfortunately is how a lot of this is still done. Uh, we're working on actually rewriting all of this uh, in Node.js and, and uh, using web frameworks, but that I'll talk about later. Um, and here's Nick actually with a Jupyter notebook that is showing some of the data being analyzed uh, using Spark. 
um, as essentially the experiment is happening. Um, so for a lot of the things we do, it's become really important to do as much analysis as we can, basically during the experiment at the rig. Um, I think especially as a lot of, of, of data, data sets are growing, uh, there's a regime in which we need to think about all the analysis we can do after the fact, but there's also a regime in which we basically just need to start doing as much analysis as possible at the moment of data collection and try to throw out as much as we can. Um, and I think all of, a lot of, I mean, physics has already gone that direction in a lot of their domains, and I think biology will increasingly as well. Of course, it's really hard to know all the analyses ahead of time that you're gonna be needing to do in order to do them all online, so it's a really complicated problem. Um, but we have sort of been pushing in that regime, and I'll say a little bit more about that uh, later as well. So the actual raw data that we collect looks something like this. Um, and this is data from an incredibly new uh, microscope developed by uh, Dan Flickinger in our uh, industrial design and fabrication and optics group um, at Chenalia, as well as uh, Nick Sopraniev in Carl's lab. Um, this is an incredible system. Uh, these data were collected basically about three or four weeks ago. Um, so this is something called a large field of view system. Uh, for a long time doing two photon imaging, uh, in the mouse, you are basically restricted to uh, what is approximately a 500 micron by 500 micron field of view, uh, where you're able to look at the activity of maybe about uh, a, a couple hundred neurons in one uh, area of the brain. Um, so that's what each one of these patches show. In these movies, all these little flashing spots are individual neurons. Uh, we're using something called calcium imaging. Uh, these are animals that uh, express uh, a, pro a protein, uh, GCAMP, which uh, fluoresces when neurons are active. Um, under the presence of calcium and that we see in the form of, of flashing lights, basically, in these movies. Um, so what this microscope, this new microscope lets us do is make the same kind of measurements, but now over multiple brain areas simultaneously. So in this movie, we're looking at these four panels. Uh, one of these is from somatosensory cortex, one of these is from motor cortex, one of them is from parietal cortex, uh, and one is from an anterior uh, lateral motor area. So these are two, four very different parts of the brain that are doing very different computations with respect to this behavior. Uh, and for a long time, we were basically only able to look at one at a time, which makes it really hard to do inference about how these different uh, areas are coordinating. And this new microscope is gonna let us basically look at uh, all of that simultaneously. So this is nowhere near every neuron in this animal's brain, vastly uh, smaller than that. And uh, it'll probably be a really long time before that's possible. Um, but at least we can now start making inferences about uh, at least some of the interactions that take place across brain areas, and I think at a sort of statistical level that will turn out to be one of the most interesting things um, about how activity across different areas underlies computation. Question, yeah. How do you get stable images out of a brain? Great question. Uh, so the first, the, oh, so repeat the question. So the question was how do you get stable images, of which these sort of more or less appear to be, um, when, of, of a moving mouse brain? So the first part of the answer is that you want it to move as little as possible. Um, so both by, by using behaviors where the animal is exploring a virtual environment but is not actually moving, the head is, is literally fixed, it's attached to a, a bar that holds it in place. Um, so that minimizes a, a large amount of motion. There is still residual brain motion, so uh, that's actually a good segue. One of the things we have to do is correct for the residual motion that occurs, whether it's due to just sort of motion of the brain or a little bit of motion despite the fact that the animal is more or less fixed in place. Does the, so the mouse is on a big ball. Yeah. So does the mouse have control over the direction in which it thinks it's traveling or is the ball moving? Oh yeah, so it's a, it's a big styrofoam um, air supported ball. And as the ball, I mean, the mouse is in control of it uh, with multiple degrees of freedom. So, so she it can, has enough strength to move the ball. Oh yeah, definitely. It's a very, very, very light styrofoam ball that's supported uh, by basically a bunch of air blowing up a few ping pong balls underneath. Um, and it's specially manufactured by this company, WeCutFoam.com. Uh, <laughs> if anybody wants big stone styrofoam anything, uh, check out. We, we used to do it internally in Genelia, but then we found this company, we Cut Foam. Uh, Nick found them, and they're awesome. They're, they did a really good job. Um, so that's cool, because now everybody can, it used to be like we only had a few of these huge balls, but now we can manufacture them, and people are buying these styrofoam balls over the place. Um, so you just get into weird, you just end up having to do a bunch of crazy things. Um, so you have to correct for it, too, and then you just, you just do that as a data processing step? Oh, correct for the motion, yeah. So, you know, these are, these are motion-corrected movies. Um, that is one example of a handful of different sort of basic analyses, things that we have to do with these data. Um, you know, and there are a variety of different ways of doing it. Uh, more or less, you have a problem where you have a sequence of movies and you want to align them all to some reference. 
So you have to compute a reference, and then you have to compute optimally the deltas that are going to give you alignment. Um, there are 10 different ways to do it. Uh, it's one of a handful of different things that need to be done on these data, and this is a good, a good segue. So there's, there's uh, registration, motion registration, how do you align all these to a reference? Um, and then there's like, how do you turn these raw pixel movies into something like a description of the computations that these neurons are performing? You know, so I said, you know, each of these little spots corresponds to an individual neuron, but I, I, we have to do some analysis to get us to that point. Um, and that's a lot of the, the analytical work we've been developing um, is really to sort of solve those problems. And it matters in terms of there's a, a scale problem because uh, these data, although they're not enormous, you know, we're not like the Large Haldron Collider, but each one of these data sets is maybe 50 gigabytes. Um, and we're doing them every day, so there's multiple data sets being generated every day. Uh, and you want to turn them around as quick as possible. And a lot of these analyses we do involve a lot of iteration. So it really does matter that we can sort of do things, do things efficiently and do things quickly. Um, so I'm going to speak a little more generally about, about data analysis uh, in general. Uh, my foray into this world really came from having to work with the kind of data I was just showing. But in the process, I became just really interested in uh, sort of data analysis problems across, across a lot of different domains, I mean, especially in biology, um, and really almost started to research and try to understand what were the different challenges of different uh, data analysis uh, problems. And I've sort of come to think that a, a lot of the problem comes from the fact that, that data analysis used to look like this, um, this picture here, where we have data, or raw data, and then we have results, and the path is pretty much straightforward. It's basically linear. Um, there's only, you know, more or less one or two different ways of doing things, uh, and we can get there pretty quickly. And if we're in this regime, and there are still cases where we probably are in this regime, it doesn't really matter how you structure things. You can just write some script in basically any language uh, to achieve the result you want to get from, from input to output. But a lot of things in, in biology especially, but really across the board, uh, starts to look more like this. And this is kind of what we're doing all the time now. And I think often this has happened uh, a little bit by accident. People thought they were in the first regime, and then you're just like, ah, if I just make the script longer, if I just keep adding pieces to it, maybe it'll start to solve my more complicated problem. Um, but when, in fact, what you're actually doing is something like this, then it becomes incredibly complicated. And one thing we've thought a lot about is how we can take the kinds of analyses that, that we do and lots of different groups do and find points of commonality. So especially for something like analyzing this imaging data, there are hundreds of labs that are collecting data exactly like this. And basically, every single one of their, those labs has invented some complicated pipeline that basically looks like this. Um, and I've like, studied all these pipelines because I talk to people about, about sort of what they do. Um, and I totally like, I see how it happens. And it happens because uh, the data sets are a little larger than is comfortable. Again, we're not talking about hundreds of terabytes. But they're large enough that it becomes complicated to work with. And if you're limited by the bounds of a single machine, you end up doing a lot of complicated stuff to save out partial results and do various complicated things. Um, I also just think part of it is the inherent complexity of the kind of stuff we're doing. Um, you know, the nature of these data are changing really quickly. Uh, the kind of data we're looking at now is really different than what we were looking at even two years ago or four years ago. So you're constantly updating different pieces of this picture. Um, and also there's just lots of different kinds of data. Even for what I was just showing you, we have long sequences of movies which you can think of either as images or you can think of as time series because they're extended in time. Then there's also the position of the animal on the ball, which is this sort of analog one-dimensional variable. There's uh, the actual movie of the whiskers. I didn't even talk about that, but we actually take high-speed video of the whiskers. Uh, there's a lot of really cool work here actually at HMS on really cool analyses of uh, behavioral data by looking at video, whether of whiskers or of mice in general. Um, uh, freely behaving mice, that's like a whole interesting class of data, and somehow we're trying to put all of that together, and that becomes really complicated. Um, so I don't, I don't know how to solve that. Um, I know what I, I sort of want it to look like, uh, which is something like this. Um, I really feel that, that we, can, we can all try, and, and if we try, um, achieve uh, something like a regime in which we build all of our analysis pipelines out of small composable pieces that have, are, are modular and have well-defined interfaces and can talk to other well-defined uh, interfaces of other modular pieces. And if we try to build everything we build out of these small pieces, then we can try to figure out the points of commonality between the different pipelines that we're, we're all building and try to use as many reusable parts for as much of it as possible and push all the icky stuff to the edge that's the stuff that ultimately has to be domain-specific um, or like specific to your lab, which will happen at some point. You can't totally eliminate that. But we can try as hard as possible to make as much of it as possible 
uh, sort of modular and reusable across groups. Um, and I think achieving this definitely even in one domain of biology is really hard. Achieving it across the board is maybe impossible. Um, but uh, I heard about really cool efforts here that I think speak to this, uh, and it's definitely something we've been trying to work on uh, in our own domains to try to solve some of these problems. Um, so that's very sort of philosophical. What are the actual tools that we use? Um, uh, it's changing all the time. Um, one thing that has definitely been a bedrock, and I think uh, I totally encourage uh, people learning about it, uh, as John was describing before, is Spark. And we've done a lot with Spark uh, really from the early days, back in, I was like 0.7, I think, um, which was not the first version, but it definitely was early stages. Uh, and, you know, it was really fun to be involved with, I have to say, uh, really watching that project evolve and getting involved in it when it still kind of felt like a research project was really fun. There was a lot of interesting, still is a lot of interesting development happening. Um, it's been really fun to be involved in. I got to know uh, very well Mate and other people in the, in the Spark team. Um, so we do a lot of, with Spark to do uh, sort of the heavy lifting part of a lot of the data analysis that we do. I said, you know, we have to register 50 gigabytes or, or in some cases like whole brain zebrafish imaging, it's a terabyte of imaging data. And then we have to do filtering in, in, on images and we have to do filtering in time. And then we have to do various kinds of maybe dimensionality reduction in space and time. Um, and that's really what we use, we use Spark for. But we use it alongside a bunch of other things. Um, so we do a lot, uh, a lot of the stuff we do in general is in Python. I'm no particular uh, Python uh, evangelist. Uh, I, I like it and I found it useful for a, a lot of the problems we're solving, um, especially with scikit-learn. Um, we do a lot with cloud compute, uh, including both Amazon Web Services, increasingly Google um, Compute Engine. Again, I have no particular allegiance, but I find the DevX experience of Google Cloud to be a lot better. Um, and uh, I'll talk about it later. We do a lot with uh, WebGL and Node. Uh, JS and JavaScript. Um, I actually kind of want us to do everything in JavaScript. Um, that's totally crazy, um, but I'll give a reason maybe at the very end as to why. Um, and then these two projects in the lower left are two things we're working on, uh, Thunder and Bolt, that I'll, I'll very briefly describe. Um, but I can basically talk about it for the entire afternoon uh, if anyone wants to. Um, and I want to highlight Jason Wittenbach in our group. Um, so these two projects, which are focused on uh, analysis of the kind of imaging data that I was describing before, um, image and time series data, not just neuroscience data. So these are, are projects that can speak to, I think, a wide variety uh, of time and image analysis problems. Uh, we've certainly developed them in the context of some of this neuroscience imaging data. Um, Jason's done a lot of the pushing and heavy lifting recently, though there have been lots of contributors, including uh, Andrew Gazelle in the room, uh, and maybe someone else, uh, possible. Um, so these have been really fun products to work on. Um, and at a very high level, there's sort of three things that, that we're trying to achieve in this roadmap. Uh, these goals have evolved over time. Um, very, in the early stages, especially with Thunder, uh, it really was basically a high, higher level interface that rode on top of Spark and was very wedded to Spark um, and basically allowed uh, people to express in very simple uh, uh, sort of combinations of, of, of Python components, express image and time series analytics that were using Spark under the hood, but at a higher level that made it easy to not necessarily know about a lot of the details of what Spark was doing under the hood and work with its own data structures and instead think at a higher level about a variety of different image and time series operations. Um, but one of the things we, we realized, and that was great, it worked, it worked really well and it let us do things in orders of magnitude uh, less time if we had the compute power available. And for some of these things, that really made a difference to be able to, you know, someone said, how do you do the image registration? Well, there's 30 different ways to do it. If we can try every single one and get an answer back in about a minute or 30 seconds, then it lets us iterate really quickly on how to, how to solve those problems. Um, so that's been really huge, but one of the things we found is that uh, a lot of people, either at a particular stage of their analysis or just given the nature of their data, didn't necessarily want uh, everything that Spark, uh, so they didn't need the power of a cluster. Uh, maybe they needed it at some stage of their analysis, but they didn't need it at another stage. Um, so we had a lot of people who basically liked the APIs we were building, they liked the data structures we were, we were providing, but they were like, why can't we just use this, but I don't actually want to deal with the Spark part, at least maybe not right now. Or they want to test things out in a local computing regime and then switch over and do something with cluster computing with Spark. So the main problem we've been trying to solve, and I think now have, have almost solved it, not all of this is, is totally in master branch on the various GitHub repos yet, but it's, it's basically happening right now, is I really wanted it to be possible to write uh, a single script or you know, a few lines of code that express a computation at a very high level and have that script exactly run in the most efficient way possible locally, if you happen to be running locally, and if you happen to be backed by a Spark cluster, to have it run in a distributed regime 
without changing a single line of code and without having you have to think about the fact that in one case it's happening locally and in one case it's happening distributed. Um, and the way basically we solved that was uh, through the, what became a subproject, Bolt, uh, which is by building a, a distributed multidimensional array that looks a lot like, and in fact is, in terms of its interface, uh, exactly the same as a NumPy array. So it is exactly a local array, except that all the underlying computations take place uh, or are backed by uh, data structures that uh, happen over a cluster using Spark. But you can treat it as a local array, which means if you write code that assumes the input is a local array, it will then work if it is actually a local array, and it will work if it is this object that is backed by Spark <coughs> computation. And that basic data structure allows us to now start writing a variety of different modular and composable analysis pieces that if they just assume they're getting this thing, which can be a local array and can be a distributed array, but it always looks the same, uh, then we can write all kinds of tools and analyses that will work exactly whether you're local or whether you're distributed. Um, and I should say, we, we started to think about this alongside a handful of other really cool projects that you should check out as well. Um, there's something called Dask in the Python world that provides related abstractions and is actually doing some really cool stuff in distributed computing right now. Um, alongside just data structures for this stuff. Um, there's also something called the S-frame or the S-array. Um, so I think there's a, I think probably maybe in three or four years there will be some really nice unified version of all this stuff, of these kind of unified local and distributed data structures. This is one stab at that. Um, and I think there will probably be a lot of others. And it's a really exciting space right now. Are there any questions about that part? All right. Cool. Oh. Oh, I have no Wi-Fi. Interesting. Well, not entirely. Um, all right, it doesn't actually matter. It should be on the text of Bird. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, for that one, yeah, not Bird in general. Oh. And no, he chose right one. Yeah. I chose the right one? Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, don't, I don't get internal? There you go. It's next time. Okay, cool. Let's refresh. Oh, really? Um, one thing I wanted to highlight uh, that's not directly using or, or, or necessarily tied to, to either Thunder or Boulder or these things, but is another aspect of how we're trying to think about analyses in this space. Um, is something called NeuroFinder, and this is sort of a group we started called Code Neuro. Uh, we do basically events and meetups where we try to bring together people doing neuroscience and people doing various kinds of tech stuff outside of neuroscience. Um, and we do tutorials like neuroscience for coders and coding for neuroscientists. Um, and that, both of those turned out to go really well at the last one. I was a little nervous. Um, so one of the things I think in a lot of these analysis problems, uh, a lot of the challenge is that we don't actually have any kind of ground truth for the problem that we're solving. So we spent a lot of time developing algorithms. Uh, that's sort of what I was doing uh, a lot more in my PhD. Um, but when I started doing a lot of this analysis, I realized that there, for a lot of these problems, say, how do you find neurons? That's this one. Uh, how do you find neurons in this imaging data, which is sort of like a machine vision matrix decomposition problem? Um, there are about 30 NIPS papers that describe some really complicated algorithm for solving that problem. But most of them don't have any code associated with them. And most of them are not actually testing against a data set where we have ground truth. So I think it's great. Like, I love crazy algorithm development. It's super fun. Um, and it's really interesting. But we, I think we need to start combining it with things like that, you know, ground truth data sets. And this has been very successful in the machine vision community. Um, you know, we're certainly not the first to try to do this. Um, I think we just want to port that idea of having well-defined ground truth gold standard data sets and put them out there online and build APIs like the one here where you can uh, basically submit algorithms or submit results and have them immediately benchmarked and vetted against all the standard data sets um, just to sort of figure out what the state really is. You know, have we, in this case, solved this problem or haven't we? You know, these, these algorithms that people have written NIPS papers about, um, maybe they work really well and maybe they don't and we just need to figure it out. So this is what, if people are interested in that particular problem, uh, you should check this out if you're interested in this class of, of approach to a solution. Uh, I encourage you to check it out as well. Many of us are very interested in this class. Class of approach, yeah. How, 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 um, how abstracted is the framework in which you're doing this for these neuroscience challenges? So suppose you want to do this for single cell RNA seq oh, yeah. for genetics or for you know other other types of data. How how generic is, is your framework? Oh, so potentially very generic, um, and we're actually right now in the process of revamping it. Probably the most useful thing um, is more of a sort of story about how this went in the initial. So we're actually launching a second version of this. Um, the very first version, uh, this was, a little, I think, a little naive and high-minded of me. Um, I really like the idea that people would, to sort of ensure reproducibility of algorithms, people would actually submit the code 
And even better, they would submit Docker images that would run the analysis that they were claiming solved the problem. So we would have all the standard data sets, people would submit Docker images, and we built a really nice generic system for doing that. And then by running their Docker images on the data, we would automatically generate the results files. And basically, despite having about 20 people that I was sort of getting close to getting to the point of submitting Docker images for this, basically just nobody could do it. Um, I think there were, there were too many limitations that I should have seen coming. So one, this is just the state of things right now, about 90% of the people working on this problem um, have written solutions in MATLAB that involve various kinds of complex compiled C code. Um, so putting MATLAB in a Docker container um, is not only, it's either impossible or illegal, depending on who you talk to. Uh, <laughs> And although that sort of appealed to me, um, <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> uh, I'm a huge open source advocate, if that wasn't clear. Um, that, uh, yeah, that really just didn't seem like a practical way to, that seemed like a problem, basically. <laughs> um, and for even the people that were doing their stuff in Python, for example, uh, you know, Docker, I, although I love it and we use it for something <laughs> I'll talk about in just a second, um, if the DevX experience of Docker is kind of a pain. Uh, it's pretty hard to use. Um, I think for a lot of people, just getting to that point was too difficult. So uh, we are now in the process of basically restructuring things totally differently so that people don't submit Docker images or their code, they just submit a results file, which is way simpler. Um, so I think we'll, I mean, we're building that r right now and it will be done really soon. Uh, and we will try to make it as general as possible. It'll be a little module that you can just add um, and, and can plug in your own data sources and can plug in your own uh, sort of schema for what the results files look like, uh, and it will automatically generate a little web app with a leaderboard and stuff. Um, so, and if there are ways to make it more general to solve other problems, we should talk about that. Um, but basically, yeah, the full-blown version, which I love, I think will, I don't know, we just need to wait. Um, it's too, it was too soon. So you said there's no ground truth, so what is the leaderboard? Oh, sorry, so we are, part of this effort was to put together a bunch of ground truth oh. data sets. Now, what ground truth is in this case, and in a lot of cases, is complicated. Um, so the two things we can do here, one is we can, uh, while doing this uh, GCAMP imaging, where the, the, the actual neuron cell, cell bodies are, are flashing, we can simultaneously co-express a marker in the nucleus of cells that basically labels every single neuron with a little dot. So it's not perfect, but at some base level, uh, if all you're asking is, my algorithm has found there to be a neuron at this location, is there in fact a neuron at this location? That more or less is background truth. So Carl's group at Genelia um, has basically done, uh, you know, gotten those mice and we've now generated a bunch of data sets where we have ground truth. The other ground truth is just to have someone go in and hand draw, which, you know, it sounds crazy, but on the other hand, if you can have an algorithm that does just as well as your hand labeling, then you, you're, for a lot of people, that would be great because now it's like what you were doing before except that you're not spending an hour in front of the keyboard for every data set. Is it a lot, a lot easier to label the nucleus than, say, synapse? Oh, sorry, yeah. So the reason the nuclear marker is a, it works as a ground truth is because that problem becomes sort of trivial. If you're looking at one of these images and the nuclei are labeled, then you're really just looking for little spots on an image and it's super clean. Um, it becomes complicated because in the in images like the ones I showed, uh, it's, the, it's the whole cell, so you're seeing uh, sort of cytosolic signal, and then there's all, you're also seeing signal in processes, and resolving all of that and separating and like demixing uh, all of those signals becomes really complicated. And this is the thing that people have written 30 MIPS papers about how to do. Do you have test data sets that you'll make available to people? Oh, sorry, yeah, so that's one of the two things this provides. So there's both like a data, there's a result submission part, but then we have about now, I think, 20 training data sets. Um, as well as the held out data sets where we don't provide people with the answers. Um, yeah, so those are all available. They're on Amazon S3, and there's a GitHub repo that has links to download all of them. Um, so you can download all the data and, and, and play with it. Yeah, totally. If anyone wants to solve a great computer vision problem that contributes to neuroscience, you should try this. Um, so I want to say a little bit about visualization, um, which is sort of the flip side to analysis. They, they often they happen together. Uh, and really here, I'll, I'll, everything we do is, is uh, credited to Matt Conlin, who's a, a fantastic, uh, actually he's actually a computational journalist who works half-time at 538, Nate Silver's like web uh, polling prediction uh, group, and then the rest of the time he works with us at Genelia on uh, like data viz science problems. Um, so one, one cool open source project that uh, we've been working on um, is called Lightning that I encourage people to check out, it might be of interest. 
Um, so Lightning was our way of trying to attack some of these problems about uh, composability and sharing of, uh, of sort of modular components but in the space of visualizations. Um, and the particular starting point we had for Lightning was that we find, as I think probably a lot of people agree, the most interesting stuff in data viz right now is happening in the web browser. Um, whether it's through a variety of different uh, uh, sort of web technologies and frameworks that have been developed for doing data visualization in the browser, or just the, the fact that the browser is this place where you can combine different kinds of vector graphics and pixel graphics and 3D graphics uh, with really nice high-level APIs. So the web is a really great place to be doing data visualization right now. Um, but one of the problems is that we still do a lot of our data analysis in other languages. We're not doing our data analysis in JavaScript, not yet. Um, and instead we're doing it, I'm just gonna keep talking about that, uh, and instead we're doing it in Python or we're doing it in Scala. Um, so now we have to constantly be solving this problem of how do we do our data visualization in the browser, but we're still doing our, our analysis in a different language. Um, and again, this is something a handful of people have thought about um, and some interesting solutions floating around. Um, our approach was to uh, basically say, the browser is awesome, we should do data visualization in JavaScript, we should write our data visualization in JavaScript, and we're just gonna provide a really easy way uh, and a modular way to connect data that we have from these other languages to our visualization. So Lightning uh, is a Node.js server, but we've bundled it using something called Electron into a desktop application. So you can literally drag this little thing when you install it into your applications folder. Uh, and what that does, without installing any node or doing any server man managing, it starts up a little node server in the background uh, that you can get in little, it's in the menu bar. Um, that just shows you that the server's running. And then you have access to a large collection of visualizations, and each one of these visualizations is a small, well-defined module. It's independently versioned and documented. Um, it's published as a module on NPM, which is the Node Package Manager. But the idea is that each one of these visualizations has its own dependencies. It can use whatever complex uh, visualization library you want. It can use D3, it can use 3JS, it can use StackGL, it can use uh, some map. You know, obviously we don't do anything with maps, but there's a map visualization. Um, and uh, each one of these can use whatever libraries it wants. And then uh, we have a very thin client, uh, many thin client libraries written in Python and Scala, uh, R, and a couple other languages um, that let you generate these visualizations um, and render them, for example, inside of IPython notebooks or Jupyter notebooks um, by sending data from within your environment. So you can call things like lightning.scatter, give your data in Python, and it generates a lightning scatter plot, which is actually rendered uh, using whatever module uh, and whatever web technologies were used to render that visualization. Um, so uh, one of the cool things is that it makes it now really easy to build some custom visualization for whatever problem we want and then bundle it together into one of these little modules that can then be shared with anybody. So if I come up with a way of hand labeling uh, neurons in the form of a visualization like the one on the left, or some cool way of browsing and, and sort of streaming through a bunch of time series data like the thing on the right, uh, I can now, that, that's a little module, and anyone who's using Lightning, uh, whether in the browser or in, say, a Jupyter Notebook, can now generate exactly the same visualization uh, just by providing data to it in a really simple way. So uh, the goal is to not have to have everyone over and over again solve that problem of how do I get data from my data analytics environment into wherever I'm trying to do my uh, sort of web-based visualization. Um, and sort of along those lines, uh, I saw as I walked, walked in this morning, there was a Jupyter Notebook on the board, so I know people here are more or less familiar with it. Who's used the Jupyter Notebook? Oh, great, okay, awesome. Uh, then I don't need to convince you, uh, uh, what it, it, what it, convince you of what it, what it lets you do. Just to be clear, that Jupyter is a more recent name of what used to be iPython you, Notebook. Formerly known as the iPython Notebook, currently known as the Jupyter Notebook. Uh, just because they made it more language general. So the JU stands for Julia, and the PI stands for Python, and the R is for R. I don't know what the TE is. I think that just doesn't work. Um, it's not JavaScript. Uh, <laughs> so uh, the Jupyter Notebook, yeah, is, a, is a, a fantastic way, I think, to organize in a executable sequence um, code blocks and the results that, that code generates, just at a very fundamental level. Um, and we've been doing a lot with this, and we think it's, I, you know, I don't, I don't put all of our code in Jupyter Notebooks. I actually get a little worried when I see a Jupyter Notebook that's thousands of lines of code long, because um, I, I think that's sort of not quite what, you know, it's actually a little, it becomes hard to keep track of what's going on, basically, if that's how you structure your code. Um, but as a way to sort of summarize uh, how you used a sequence of modules in whatever language to do an analysis and generate a result in a form that you can then click play and run through the whole thing, it's fantastic. And I basically think this uh, should be 
uh, how we think about uh, disseminating pretty much all of scientific information, um, especially in the domain of kind of computationally oriented scientific information. Uh, and that's something my group became really interested in recently. Um, and we started building some tooling around trying to, to really push that as for that idea as far as possible. Um, so first of all, we have a bunch of, or a couple examples now of projects where uh, these are things that there's a publication associated with the project, but from the beginning, and actually way before we published anything, uh, we started putting into GitHub repos, basically a collection of Jupyter notebooks, uh, as well as all of the necessary data and any necessary modules that were required into a Jupyter notebook that generates every single figure, if you run those notebooks, generates every single figure that would then be part of the eventual paper. Um, again, we did this before the paper was, was even submitted. Um, and I generally believe, I mean, I'm a huge advocate of, yeah, doing everything as much as possible in the open from the beginning. Uh, I really believe, you know, I think a lot of people are maybe starting to move in this direction, but we're still thinking about, uh, you know, fine, we should publish all the data in the code after the paper's already been published. Um, I'm a little more radical. I think we should be doing as much as we can in the open as early as possible. Um, and the reason, one reason, is that I think it's really liberating. This concept that we do data analysis sort of scurried away at our desk, it's just you maybe and your advisor, um, and you're doing all your data analysis, and you're sort of worried about whether it's correct or not, and you don't have a lot of external feedback, and then, you know, you go to publish the paper, and then only after that does anyone ever get to see it, uh, and then if, you, if someone finds an error, it's this horrible thing where you have to publish some awkward correctum, uh, what do they call it, correctograndum, um, that sort of indicates you somehow failed because you made a mistake. I just think it's totally the wrong model. We should think about research as a constantly evolving process. Uh, I think the GitHub repo is actually a phenomenal model for what that could look like. Uh, you know, Nick put all of his notebooks and all of his code here. Uh, it's in a module. If somebody finds a problem, they can submit an issue, and then we bump the version because we fixed the problem. Um, and if you want to like slap a date at some point and call that the paper, I think that's totally fine and valuable. Um, but this is, I think, a very different way to think about uh, structuring some of that information. Now, one of the problems uh, is that if you want to start thinking of this as a, a sort of artifact of science that is reproducible and sort of lives on uh, potentially in, you know, ind indefinitely, um, just having these notebooks are not enough because now you run into the problem of whether or not this runs on all machines, right? So we can put all this stuff in a notebook, but if I clone this notebook and then I run it because I don't have the right versions of different things or I'm not on the right operating system or whatever other problem, uh, then now I haven't really solved the problem because it's not really reproducible anymore. So that's what we wanted to solve um, by building something that we built called Binder. Um, and Binder uh, really grew out of a few conversations with uh, Fernando Perez, who is the creator of, of IPython and Jupyter, and Brian Granger. Um, it also was the work of uh, uh, Andrew Osheroff on my team, uh, who does not really know how to work um, hotel coffee machines, um, but he's an incredibly talented uh, engineer. And uh, together, we, or he looks excited, maybe he did finally figure it out. I don't remember. Um, uh, the, so what Binder lets you do, and it's just at mybinder.org, um, Binder's website that lets you take a repo, a GitHub repo that you tell us, and we take that repo and we package together all of the code in the repo, all of the notebooks, all of the data, and a specification of the environment required to run all of that and we bundle it into something called a Docker image. Who here is familiar with Docker? Oh, great, awesome, okay. So we put it into a Docker image, um, and we do that on some server somewhere, and then we preload all of those Docker images across a cluster uh, running something called Kubernetes, which is a Docker container scheduler, um, opens, recently open sourced by Google. Basically, right, they open sourced it right around the time that we wanted to use it uh, for this, which was really cool. Um, so what we do, once we build this image um, and have all its specifications, is we can then embed into the GitHub repo this little badge that when you click on that badge, it essentially is a run this repo in a virtual environment because it's launching the Docker container that we built to have all the specification and requirements associated with this, uh, with this repo, which is all the requirements associated with your project. Um, so we currently maintain a public server um, we really believe in this being a sort of pub for open source and open science, a public service. Um, so we have a public server that uh, currently has about a thousand binders on it already. Um, and we have about a thousand of these containers launched every day. Um, so they're great, I think, for publications. As far as I'm concerned, this is now, like we've locked this to a git, kick, a git commit hash, which means that this is, will forever be an image that will run all the analyses associated with this project. Um, and anyone can now go in and straight from the browser without downloading anything, 
uh, rerun all the analyses that Nick did for this project. Yeah. And the data is also? Data, yeah. So data data is more complicated. Uh, for small data sets, you can put a lot of data in GitHub. Um, for big data sets, you have to solve it differently. Um, I think I have a slide on this. There's a really cool project uh, called DAT, which is a peer-to-peer -peer distributed ver uh, data versioning um, project. It's an open source project um, by some really close collaborators of mine. And I think moving forward, that's what we're gonna use to think about solving the data problem. Um, so right now we do a mix of putting data in GitHub repos or we put our data on, say, cloud storage. And then within the notebook, you can load in data from cloud storage. These are all network uh, accessible Docker containers. Um, but that's really cool because that would let us pin the data to a hash. So that is versioned distributed peer-to-peer -peer data, um, unlike say something like BitTorrent, um, which means that you can say this notebook depends on this hash of the data, and as long as that data is seeded by anyone on the peer-to-peer -peer network, then you have a sort of fixed version of it. Um, yeah. And are the notebooks doing processing on that data, or are they mainly taking process data and visualize? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, it's it's a mix of both right now, and we generally again sort of going back to that picture of like sequences of of, of modules. We definitely uh, tend to have a set of tools that are more focused on going from the raw data to some kind of derived thing, and then other tools that go from the derived thing to something more like the figures that you actually see. Very similar, I think, probably to what a lot of what people, and as I learned a little more yesterday, uh, a lot of people here do, um, that same kind of cascade. So right now, we put the notebooks for everything in this. So this, this repo, in this particular case, uh, it has access to 50 gigabytes of data, or you know, hundreds of gigabytes of data on Amazon S3, and you can really go through the entire sequence. Um, I think there are regimes, again, you know, these are, we're building blocks here. There are regimes in which it makes sense to maybe uh, focus, at least initially, on the sort of reproducibility of going from those derived data products to uh, the things that you're going to call the figures and the statistical analyses in your paper, because that's the part that most people are probably going to want to jump in and play around with. You know, you did your statistics one way, I'd really like to try fitting a different model. That you can do just by providing the derived uh, sort of data component and then something like the result. So suppose that it comes with a little tool that you can run uh, your local machine to infer you know, all, all the um, versions of all the packages of dependencies. So oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, some kind of, yeah. So my, oh, the, so the question is, could you, uh, is, there, is it possible to have a tool that would infer all the dependencies in the project um, so that rather than, Versions, dependencies, yeah, everything. Um, that's really cool. My group recently got, we've become interested in sort of, yeah, analysis of code for those kinds of reasons. Um, I think it's gonna be a lot harder in some, or easier in some languages than others, obviously. Um, type languages are great for that kind of thing. Um, but uh, yeah, there's a product called Depth Finder. I know it's a little Python module that tries to do this for Python projects. Like you give it a notebook and it tries to figure out what the dependencies are. Um, so that's maybe one, one thing that could go in that direction. Um, yeah, right now, obviously, you have to somewhere say something about the dependencies that your project has. And if you get that wrong, then this is not going to work. I'm asking because if I have something which runs on the machine, yeah. in theory, it should be possible to infer all of that you have to make this binary. Definitely. So you can use Docker that way because you can be, you can basically run Docker in this sort of, it's not quite interactive, but where you say, like, all right, from this point forward, I want to record everything I'm doing to go into my Docker file. And then you go and you app get and you install and you pip install and then that sort of ends up in your Docker file. Um, and Binder can run just by giving us a Docker file. So that's one way to do it. Um, there have been a lot of really cool, oh, sorry. Just to make sure I understand. So yeah. the, can this talk to a distributed computing environment? That's in, that's in progress. Um, so the, the short answer is yes, but we haven't exposed that. Uh, not because we have any intention of, like, we're not trying to sell this. Um, it's that uh, it, that's, a, that's a very expensive thing. And right now we're providing, through my lab budget at Genalia, this public server. Um, and if we start opening up uh, basically arbitrary deployments of, say, like 10 nodes, um, that just, it felt not something that we could support reasonably with the public cluster. But one of the really cool things about Kubernetes is that it basically trivially supports that. Um, as a very simple extension. So under the hood, Binder does support uh, running any of these environments with either one node or 10 nodes. It's essentially equivalent. Um, and the reason is that, what, so what Kubernetes does is basically just let you schedule uh, Docker containers. It's a massive orchestrator for Docker containers. 
um, and you can group a bunch of containers together and you can replicate containers. So you can tell Kubernetes things like, I wanna deploy this container, which has all the data in the notebooks, and then I want these 10 containers, which are Spark workers, and I want this other container, which is a Spark master, and now just like schedule that across, across my cluster. Um, and it groups them all together, puts them on the same local network, um, it allows communication among them. So we have a version, I think even on, yeah, on the website right now, uh, basically just in case you wanna be able to reproduce an analysis that you used, yeah, either Postgres or Spark, you can select Postgres or Spark when you're building your binder, and then every time it launches your container, it launches it alongside uh, either a Spark master or a container that just runs Postgres. Um, so that, because you can now just turn up the replication factor on the Spark one, we could easily have it support 10 node clusters. Um, a bigger problem that I haven't solved is like flexible management of version in, versions across a cluster. That's like one of those terrible DevOps things that nobody likes to talk about, um, but it's really lame whenever you're working in these distributed systems just to keep track of what versions of everything you've installed on all the different computers, and we have to solve that here somehow. Um, but I think what we're working towards next is that basically we want to make Binder, we want it to both be a public service that people can use for small projects, but also make it something that's really easy for other groups and institutes to deploy um, on their own cloud compute, uh, so sort of bring your own compute model. So uh, we have just now finished doing a lot of changes to the core of Binder that makes it really easy to deploy in your own system. So basically, if you have, access, if you have a Kubernetes cluster, now installing Binder and running blind Binder and deploying it is like a, it's a command line tool basically, and we have a, a fully sort of customizable generic web interface that lets you monitor how many notebooks you've deployed and what, you know, what's running on your cluster. Um, so I'm a, I like this concept of like federated binders where you know, every institute uh, or every group runs its own binder and lets everyone at that institute use as much compute power as they decide they want to let people use. So that's kind of my model moving forward. Um, I don't want to build like the one public server to support all computing and science, that seems. Kind of intense. Uh, that being said, there have been some really cool use cases um, that, yeah, again, you can see how I get pretty outside of my core subject area. Um, but this one was really exciting to us. So uh, during the, uh, the LIGO gravitational waves result, um, their group, the LIGO group is amazing because they put all their data available um, online and they do a lot with Jupyter Notebooks, which is super cool. And then Min, who's part of the Jupyter project, put together a binder version of the uh, LIGO data analysis. Uh, which meant that now anybody who goes to that repo, you can just click and start playing around and like reproduce all the core uh, core results from that paper and change the color of the plots. Or I don't know, I don't know anything about uh, this bring or really a lot of domains of physics, so I don't I wouldn't know how to do the analysis differently. But I'm sure some people do, um, and that would be of interest. Um, so it's one example. This one totally destroyed our servers because I woke up and we had like thousands and thousands of queued binders that we're trying to launch, um, and we weren't we just like didn't know we'd ever encounter that volume and I texted Andrew uh, at like seven in the morning and said that <laughs> something wasn't working and then we, when we realized what had happened, it all made a lot of sense. Um, so that was really exciting. Uh, there have also been cool use cases like people have used Binder to make reproducible versions of data analysis uh, for like uh, news stories. Um, so there's some really interesting uh, publications from both New York Times and Huffington Post on uh, uh, gun sales and Syrian refugees and people have now built binders that let you explore interactively and regenerate basically all the figures in the news article. Uh, and I really believe that sort of across the board, anything we consume that is data and is statistical analysis of data, uh, if it's on a topic that is relevant to our world, we should be able to have access to figure out exactly what was done and reproduce it and see if we draw the same conclusions. Um, so that's a use case that I'm, I'm really excited about. Um, so DAT is, uh, DAT I mentioned before, um, is this uh, project for doing peer-to-peer -peer, uh, version uh, sharing of data. I'm super excited about it. I think it's really gonna change, uh, change a lot of things, and we're excited to use it uh, in Binder as well as in a number of other ways um, to uh, facilitate some of the sharing of large data part of this sort of reproducibility problem um, as, uh, for, the, yeah, for these reproducible environments that we're trying to build. Um, I won't say too much, uh, a totally, totally different side project um, that's using DAT under the hood um, uh, this is part of something called Code for Science, which is a group that Max uh, Ogden and I started. Max is the lead developer on DAT, which is an open source project. Um, and Code for Science is a group we started to basically just bring together discussions about a lot of this kind of stuff and sort of put it all in one place. Um, and very recently, we started something called Science Fair, 
uh, which is basically a desktop application that uses peer-to-peer -peer, uh, uh, data syncing to allow you to browse, uh, search, and download open access journal articles. Um, we basically want to have something that's really fast in terms of accessing uh, article content, but also very forward-looking in terms of the fact that in the future, articles won't just be PDFs, but there'll be lots of other things. So we want to build infrastructure to make that really easy to share lots and search lots of different kinds of information. Um, and by having it all built on peer-to-peer -peer, uh, technologies, it means that no one institute, say, a particular journal or a particular government agency is now the single point of failure for losing all of that information. So when people use Science Fair, and this is super in progress, I should say, uh, and is a, a joint project with Richard Smith Una, and, and Max, um, when people uh, now start downloading articles through the use of this app, it becomes part of a peer-to-peer -peer network that allows all that information to be shared. Um, so this is something that I think will grow a lot uh, in the next couple months. Um, the very last thing I'll, I'll talk about, I guess I have another five minutes, is that, yeah. is that cool? Okay, um, is to try to come back to the science uh, a little bit. So this is what happens in the group. We like get distracted by all these interesting problems that we're trying to solve. Um, but we do care a lot about solving some, some basic questions in biology. Um, and I've been really excited by a, a push recently that begins with this system that I talked about at the very beginning, uh, where we have a mouse inside of a virtual environment. Um, and over the last uh, couple years, we've been doing a lot of work um, basically, it's trying to understand how the parts of the mouse's brain that are involved in representing tactile information encode sensory information during this behavior. Um, so mainly, we've been looking at an area called the somatosensory cortex, which is responsible for, uh, we think, representing things like how the, the walls are uh, positioned relative to the animal. Um, and we've been doing a lot of recordings, um, including recordings uh, using imaging, the imaging methods I talked about before, as well as doing single neuron uh, uh, recordings uh, using silicon probes. So these are electrical recordings where we record the activity of individual spikes in neurons. Um, and I'm showing here an example of some of those recordings where each one of these here is a neuron and each row is a trial and each little dot represents the time that that neuron fired a spike. And we're looking at that over time as these walls come in towards the animal and then remain locked at a position close to the animal's uh, face. And what we see uh, is this very beautiful pattern where individual neurons seem to be tuned or respond to the wall being at particular positions. So there's, and these happen to be, these neurons were recorded at the same time. Um, if you look at this in terms of tuning, if you plot the, the rate of firing as a function of the distance of the wall relative to the animal, you see that these neurons are tuned to the position of the wall, whether it's far away or whether it's close. Um, and there's nothing sort of, I think, deeply surprising about this. Uh, it makes sense that the animal should have some way to use a population of neurons to represent something like the position of the wall relative to it. Um, but it gives us a pretty good understanding in a regime where we didn't know necessarily uh, nearly as much about the basic sensory encoding of what's being represented. Um, so we were doing this for a while, and we started to become interested and have long been interested in trying to push beyond basic sensory encoding, although that's a really important first step, um, and to think about how the animal's brain is representing more complex behaviors. So things uh, not just where the wall is relative to the animal, but where is the animal inside of an environment? Can it learn to sequence uh, 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 actions through an environment to figure out how to get from one point to another? Um, and this required a, a pretty cool extension uh, that we had a lot of fun developing to the basic setup. So instead of having walls on either side of the animal uh, only, which allows it to navigate a corridor, which was enough to make uh, inferences like the one shown here, uh, we needed to add uh, a new wall. Oh, I should say we also do imaging uh, to look at similar tuning to wall position, um, but I'll skip that. Um, so this is a video of the, of the setup as it exists right now. Uh, and the idea was basically if we needed a way to explore more complicated environments, then instead of having just two walls, we need to have three walls. And these three walls together are gonna create a experience of being inside of basically a virtual maze that uh, has not only corridors, but also branch points. So the way this works is basically, uh, if it's not totally obvious watching the movie, so you have walls on either side. These ones are on motors. The one in the front is on a motor, too. It moves back and forth, and it moves left and right on a little servo motor. And as the animal runs, as she like, approaches a point that is a choice point, the wall in the front comes forward. And as she goes a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right, that wall starts to rotate to make her think that she's going in one direction. And then as she commits to a decision, this wall will rotate and then move out, and the other wall will come back in to recreate the experience of running down a corridor. So there's this one moment where the virtual we have to sort of break the virtual reality. Um, but for the rest of the time, we think it creates a very compelling 
a, a sort of feeling, uh, again, sort of ethologically appropriate of being inside of now a sort of maze that has multiple branch points um, and the ability to explore. So we've been doing some very preliminary, this is very early stage, but we've done some very preliminary uh, behavioral characterization to show that uh, what we want to happen at least is that animals can really quickly learn something about the structure of their environment in this, in this regime. Um, so here's an example. This was, again, it's anecdotal, but it was the first time that this put their mouse, um, it was the first time she had been in this particular configuration of, uh, of this maze. She had been doing just basic left-right turns. Um, so here are the first six trials that she was inside this particular configuration, and the white block there is the location that if she gets to it, she gets rewarded by a little drop of juice. Um, and just delivered in a little, little lick port. Um, so what we're seeing is that the first couple of times she's sort of confused, uh, you know, she goes the wrong way, she backs up. Uh, they really don't like to get stuck, which is why they then back up. Um, but after a couple of trials, she seems to be nailing it every single time. Um, she's going straight towards the target location. Now, there's a whole bunch of caveats here. This is, you know, it's one mouse. Um, we're, we're now more rigorously characterizing this behavior, but we, we are pretty confident that the animals can learn very quickly how to solve certain simple problems right now inside of these virtual environments. And we think that the walls collectively, again, because these animals are so tactile, provide a really compelling sensory experience. Have you tried combining that with uh, putting them inside a real maze afterwards and seeing if they can solve the same maze just from the virtual reality experience beforehand? Oh, that's super cool. That's a great experiment. Uh, no, but we should totally do that. That's a great idea. Uh, yeah, we could easily take them. These are, you know, these are many-day experiments. They go in, they go out. We could easily put them into, uh, yeah, into a real, a real version of the same maze. Um, three trial learning. Is it really that good, generally? Uh, <laughs> we don't know yet. Uh, it's if this is yeah. So I'm very excited if we if this can, if this is real. Um, so quite a while. This is an animal that was particularly good and had spent a lot of time. Um, it is true that when we dropped her into this particular configuration, she was figuring this out pretty quickly. Um, but there are a bunch of caveats. Like after this, she started going back to doing other weird stuff, which could be a sort of exploration exploitation uh, trade-off. I mean, yeah. That, so the question Andrew asked is beautiful. Um, you know, if animals can learn this quickly, you know, what do I want to know? I want to know what happened in the brain during these six trials. How is it that a very brief amount of experience is enough to figure out whether through, you know, whatever brand, fancy brand of reinforcement learning you want to think about or some totally different mechanism that we just don't understand yet. How is it that organisms can learn so quickly to sort of respond to and adapt to the structure um, in their environment? Um, uh, I won't talk about this, but this is crazy. Uh, <laughs> This is just us at a coffee shop playing with hardware. Um, that I can tell if there's time afterwards, I can tell you what that was about. Um, uh, the very last thing I'll mention is that uh, in line with those ex the experiments I was just describing, um, we became interested in pushing it in, in yet another uh, sort of slightly different and new direction. Um, and this really came from a lot of the work I used to do, which was studying the visual system and visual processing, where it was incredibly useful to be able to get intuition about uh, the experiments I was having animals do by putting images up on the screen and looking at them myself um, and having humans run experiments and actually using crowdsourcing to have thousands of humans run experiments. If you have things that humans can do that are analogous to the things you're having animals can do, it gives you a way to get intuition about how to design your experiments in a way that's really not possible otherwise. Um, so for that reason, uh, we started on this kind of crazy idea to take the kind of behaviors that we were developing for the mice and then build a human version in the form of a game that people could play in the web browser. Um, so this is something called that we're building called Hexaworld. Um, it's hexagons because I like hexagons, but also because the basic geometry of those choice points that we can simulate with the walls, if you tile those together, you end up getting hexagons. Um, so the way Hexaworld works is there's an animal or a person at a location inside the environment uh, and there are walls defined by these cues, but then there's also uh, visual landmarks, and those turn out to be really important, and we're now adding those visual landmarks both to the human version, but also now adding them back into the mouse version. So the mouse will have a simultaneous tactile environment defined by walls and a visual environment defined by things that they can see on the screen. Um, we have a, uh, a web app that lets us design uh, worlds for this game so we can build uh, little environments, um, and then the game itself uh, is rendered in 3D right now. It's using WebGL. This is a super early prototype, um, but we're building it to be available both in the browser uh, and on uh, mobile devices, and it's basically going to be a game that you can uh, play by running around and, and sort of exploring these mazes, learning the structure of the maze. We're going to have metrics uh, that allow us to derive 
various things about humans' behavior and humans' computation based on their performance in the game and then use that to do really high throughput experiments in humans that we can then use to inform the design of our animal experiments. And all the human data we generate from this will be made uh, available. I'm really interested in how uh, watching humans play these kinds of games can teach us something about uh, algorithms that might be trying to save, solve the same problems, especially if you want to train various kinds of reinforcement learning algorithms to solve these games and then compare that to how humans do it and compare it to how uh, mice do it. So this is totally in progress. Uh, it'll hopefully be on the App Store uh, reasonably soon and then you can play it. Um, it turns out game design is really hard, um, so that's been kind of a struggle. Uh, it's really easy to make games that aren't very interesting um, be really fun, like you know, Fap, Flappy Bird uh, is incredibly addictive, but it's totally uninteresting in terms of, I think, what uh, people learn when they learn it. Uh, making games that are both sort of like computationally rich and uh, fun has been a challenge, but we're working on it. Are you going to open source this code? Uh, it's already on GitHub. Yeah, so it's already open source under the MIT license. Um, it's, uh, there's a lot of prototypes and a lot of, uh, of, of variants of things right now. Um, but yeah, all the code we build for uh, rendering and actually, you know, designing the game, um, as well as uh, our like log server and the way we're collecting all the data, and then ultimately the data itself. Um, you know, I want this to be something that people play and are comfortable with having the data uh, logged. And I think one way to help do that is to make sure that all the data is made available for anybody that wants access to it. Is your website, uh, like JeremyFreeman.net website that I linked to in my email, that's probably the best starting point to find all the projects that you mentioned today. Um. Or the, so the lab, we have the freemanlab.com is a good place to go. Um, and also just my GitHub account. Um, definitely if you troll, I mean there's a lot of repos, but uh, everything I've talked about is in some repo that is connected to my GitHub account. Um, so those are good places. Also anyone can email me or, or tweet at me, is that the right? I don't know, I don't use a lot of Twitter, but uh, anyone can contact me to talk about any of this stuff. I'd be totally psyched too. Um, and I guess with that, I'm done. Totally happy to talk for a long time talk with people. Thanks so much.